My name is Hillary Hunt, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. We're going to start with an overview of the Making Sense Project, then we'll dive into our topic for today, a resource that I want to share called Million Stories. Um, we'll give you a little bit of additional information and then uh, close out with information about how to request um, Act 48 credit. Uh, the Making Sense Project is a partnership between the Pennsylvania Department of Education and Penn State University and part of an overall program focused on um, financial and economic education in the K-12 arena. If you're not familiar, you can check out our website at makingsensepa.org. Tonight's webinar is going to focus on this middle pillar. We do a little bit different each time, but today we're really focused on highlighting some financial literacy resources. So um, these are things that you can use and put to use in your classroom or for your own personal edification as well. Um, I welcome you to introduce yourself over in the chat, uh, share who you, uh, obviously your name, where you're from, what you teach, grade level, et cetera, and what you do in financial education. So Million Stories is the topic of tonight's webinar, entertainment that's right on the money is what they say. Uh, so Million Stories is a resource that I came across a little while ago. It is all focused on financial education. The primary audience really is um, millennials. So you're going to hear mention of millennials a number of times. You're going to um, hear them sort of you can kind of tell that their audience are, are those young adults, which in some cases are, are pushing up to about 40 um, right now. Um, the, um, you know, obviously our, our students in school right now are a little bit younger, um, but the, the, I think the target audience is great in terms of sort of from a general audience, it, it's definitely focused at, at younger, um, younger individuals and, and can be used, I think, for the most part um, in classrooms with teens. So um, I'm going to start by sharing with you this um, trailer that gives a little bit of an overview of Million Stories and all of the different series that it has. And then we're going to dive in and look at um, different ones specifically as we go forward. So um, you're going to notice tonight, um, because we're doing video, I'm going to toggle my camera off and on each time. Hopefully that'll help with bandwidth um, so we don't have too much lag. Um, but it does take me just a second to sort of stop video, start the, <laughs> the video, mute myself, what have you. So it's kind of one of those like where I'm trying to like, you know, pat my stomach and rub my stomach, pat my head. I don't remember that thing. Anyhow, so I'm trying to do more than one thing at once. So, all right, with that, let's watch this intro. My name is Peter Ramsey. Dory Howard. India Kinney Stern. Nancy Liu. I was named Forbes 30 Under 30. I'm one of the directors of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I'm a veteran motion picture stuntman. A three-time Olympic medalist. People were leaving out of my life. I had no job. Epic flop. This is my face plan. I'm Richard Sherman, and I am helping people be more literate and informed about being an adult. You're the breadwinner. You're the adult. Go do it. As a kid in, in, in L.A., the Watt, South Central, I don't know how I'm going to get myself out of it. Half of the American workforce are millennials, but two-thirds of us are living paycheck to paycheck. My name's Jason Howes. I run a food truck. The economy failed. The coal mine shut down. This is American Paycheck. I'm Glozell. I'm looking for a little help from my friends. I mean, we're like YouTube OGs oh, from the beginning. I was <laughs> in Vanity Fair and I had an eviction notice the same day. What? How much I talk to my son about money. Not as much as I should. Everything goes to my kids, my money, my time, my body, my emotions. There's no instruction manual for parents. Everybody, everybody What's up, people? It's your boy Joey Sasso here. This is your emergency fund. We want everyone to be safe so that you can get ready for your next gig. My name is George Igo, and I find the best things to do in a city all without spending more than $100. This is George Goes Everywhere. You better be watching Million Stories now. I mean, I'm on it, so. So by a by using that raise your hand feature, um, raise your hand if you have never seen Million Stories or you know if this is completely new to you. So find that raise your hand if if this is totally new. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are raising your hand, probably why you signed up. So that's awesome. Um, so I'm going to take you through a bunch of the different. Um, 
uh, uh, shows that they have or, or this video series that they have My name is um, that they um, have produced. Um, you can get to these either on the Million Stories website or through their YouTube channel. They also have a Facebook page, Instagram, all that good stuff, Twitter. Um, uh, Kevin has shared out with in the chat a link to the handout for tonight. So that has links to each of the different series that we're going to talk about um, so that you can sort of get there quickly. Um, all of them have, you know, a variety of different episodes. Um, they all really vary in length. So like, for example, you can see here um, on the YouTube channel, you know, some of these are just, you know, two or three minutes, some of them are six, but, you know, I don't think I, I don't think there's any that are over 10 minutes. I mean, these are all pretty brief uh, videos. They're all sort of shot in a little bit different format. Some of them are kind of like a documentary. Some of them are an interview. Um, some of them are just, you know, the, the person talking to the camera so that each series has a little bit different sort of flavor, if you will. And again, they can be used in a whole host of different ways. Um, so um, I'll be curious if you have an idea throughout the, um, the webinar, feel free to share an idea of like how you think you could use this um, or you know other ideas that, that you might have. So um, with that, let me share with you this. So this is uh, a couple of the, the names of the series that they have put together that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, Adulting with Richard Sim uh, Sherman, uh, Faceplant, Milk Money, Tip Jar, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about each of these and go a little bit more in depth with these tonight. So we're going to kick off with adulting, um, which is um, the, it's called adulting with uh, Richard Sherman, which uh, I love the term adulting. <laughs> it's used a lot um, just as a, as a general term, um, but obviously, you know, finances and figuring out how to handle your money is a big part of that. Um, so my confession is I am not a football person. I'm not a sports person. Really. I don't follow sports. We don't really watch um, any pro sports here in our household. Um, so I had to do a little bit of research to discover um, who Richard Sherman is. So he's a, um, a super Super Bowl winning uh, cornerback uh, from the NFL. Um, he was with the Seahawks and, and others. Um, I'm sure somebody will tell me that I've completely butchered that description. Um, but anyhow, he's from uh, Los Angeles and um, ended up going to uh, Stanford in California and then to, uh, getting drafted um, in the NFL. So this is his series. I'm going to share with you um, sort of a um, the trailer for it or like a little behind the scenes and then we're going to take a look at the topics uh, that are covered in this uh, in this this is the only one in the million stories uh, series of series if you will <laughs> um, that is based on specific personal finance topics so um, this is probably the easiest one to integrate if you're gonna if you're gonna integrate any I'd start here um, so let's give this a look my name is Abigail Sparrow and today we're shooting Richard Sherman um, for adulting with Richard Sherman <laughs> I'm Richard Sherman, and I am helping people be more literate and informed about being an adult, buying a car, buying a house, moving out of your parents' house, budgeting. Listen up, listen up, listen up. This is how you budget. It hits so close to home for me, because I have so many friends that, that, that need this information, that need to budget, that need to be better with their finances and to be better so that they can, they can buy a car and they can stretch their money the long way. All right, guys, this is how you invest for your future. My name is Malcolm Freeberg, and I'm one of the producers on Adulting with Richard Sherman. Richard is trying to help millennials. It's the younger people who are just approaching financial independence for the first time, who might not have all the information they need to make informed decisions, who feel scared, and it's kind of the people who close their eyes when they look at their bank accounts, or who just ignore things because they don't know. It's pretty eye-opening to recognize how little people know and how much it's affecting their everyday, which I, is why I think this is so important. Adulting is finance 101. These are the base lessons for millennials. Uh, somebody starting out in life who's never kept a budget before. This is somebody who doesn't know where to start getting health insurance. We're going to give them a one, two, three process to get to that point. Four out of every 10 Americans have no idea what the credit score is. 
the statistics speaks for themselves in terms of the amount of people who budget and don't know where their money's going, the amount of people still living with their parents, um, the amount of millennials who just blow through money and, and live paycheck to paycheck. As a person who comes from a family that went bankrupt twice and, and had those issues at a young age, um, it's really important for me to, to make sure that the next generation doesn't fall into those same pitfalls. So get your picks up, get your money up, and go out and buy a car. Easy. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. So it gives you an idea of sort of the, the tone of um, these videos. Uh, as I mentioned before, these are all focused on um, specific topics, specific for personal finance topics. So you can see each of those uh, listed here. And then I have this um, this bigger list uh, of topics as well. So um, these series continue to grow. Um, I'm not sure how many or for how long they'll continue to add different ones, but um, there's a lot of great topics in, in each of these. And um, we talked uh, in our last, well, our last webinar was focused on the, um, sort of uh, updates on what's new in personal finance and financial education. And I shared with you a series um, of videos that were of educators, um, classroom educators that teach personal finance. And one of them, um, a gentleman by the name of Tony Montgomery, uh, talked about the importance of uh, cultural relevance in providing resources for students um, that, that resonate with them so that they can see people like them and under and sort of make make connections. And so, um, one of the things that we find a lot of times is that a lot of the talking heads in personal finance um, sort of are you know stereotypical um, you know individuals. Uh, not a lot of diversity here. So, having an African American male talking about um, making wise financial decisions, um, and also talking very openly about his own personal background, um, some of the family struggles, what have you, with personal finance makes it incredibly relevant um, and, and I think um, engaging for students. So um, with that in mind, we're going to watch uh, this next one is going to be um, adulting with Richard Sherman on the topic of emergency savings, which if you were here with us for that webinar, um, you know, is, a, is an important topic and, and certainly relevant and sort of gained in its ability to be relevant, I think, uh, given everything that we've experienced in the last year with the global pandemic. So let's take a look at this one and see what you think. It seems crazy, but 60% of millennials couldn't afford a $1,000 unexpected bill. Seems like a lot of people out there rolling the dice to me. We gotta do better. Growing up, a $1,000 bill would have knocked us right out. My parents worked incredibly hard. They worked long days, um, did everything they were supposed to do. It was no fault of their own, but three kids, you know, a house, a mortgage. My dad drove trash trucks 30 years. Wake up 4 o'clock every morning, get back home about 4 o'clock every day. You know, no complaints, just do, do his job. My mom worked with mentally and physically disabled kids, did her job every day, worked hard, came home, did what she was supposed to do. But an unexpected bill is is one of us getting sick, you know, one of us breaking our arm, then all of a sudden you got a thousand dollar medical bill or somebody's car, you know, somebody's tires blow out, then you got an unexpected bill. You know, and that's that's not that uncommon. That's not that crazy. But that that happening to our family would have been really difficult. So that pushed me and it motivated me to work harder. You know, as a kid in in, in LA, the Watt, South Central, like you don't I I don't know how I'm gonna get myself out of it. I don't know how I'm gonna be different. I'm planning, I'm in my head, I'm striving that, man, I'm going to have an emergency fund. I'm going to have, you know, income that, that I can, that I can play with, that I can spurge. I can, I won't, I won't be in the same boat. I didn't know how I was going to do it, honestly, because I was in the same situation. I had the same 24 hours everybody else had, but I worked hard. You know, I got some, some good breaks, um, got some good direction from great parents and got to Sanford and the rest is history. Hustle in. We're going to set up your emergency fund right now. Bingo, Richard Sherman. Listen, seriously, you got to build your emergency fund. You got to start doing that right now. N-O-W, reach into your pockets, pull out whatever change you got, and shove it into a goldfish bowl. Now, find more ways to make this fund grow. Maybe you use uh, whatever pocket change you have each day. Maybe commit to adding 10 bucks each week. You can replenish it with a tax refund each year. I don't care, host a garage sale, selling all your old crap. Use whatever strategy comes to mind, but do something. 
All right, step two. Keep this emergency fund separate from all your other accounts. Give this nest egg space. Let it grow. Don't touch it unless absolutely necessary. Look, Lizzie, you start a new savings account, you literally call it an emergency fund. I know, look, very important. Make sure your bank isn't charging you a fee to park your money in this account. And make dang sure you got access to it at a moment's notice. It's an emergency fund. All right, here we go, step three. Look, even a few hundred dollars can bail you out of an emergency. Now, most experts are gonna tell you you should have three to six months of your expenses saved in your emergency fund. Don't panic. I know it, I know, it sounds like a lot. Look, guys, it's just like putting on weight in the off season. You do it one step at a time. The point is, is you start right now. You just keep building it. And you only touch it if absolutely necessary. Those unexpected bills can be like a boogie monster. Boogie monster. Unexpected bills? So you better keep adding to that emergency fund, or else. You're adulting now. So adult, I. All right, so tell me, what do you think? Um, can you see yourself using that one in the class or other ones that are like it? Um, what, what did you think about it? Um, you know, I like the fact that those are, uh, I think they're fun, they're engaging. I like that, that it's a mix of sort of talking to the student um, from the perspective of, you know, sort of, or, for, or to the young adult or student in, in our case, um, you know, sort of, you know, this is what you should do and sort of like, you know, that little pep talk. And then um, in each of these, the coach comes in. And so you kind of see these, um, this animation and uh, the coach is telling you, you know, th this information and sort of, you know, setting you straight on what you need to know about the uh, sort of the, the facts of this. Um, it's uh, uh, kind of a, um, kind of fun. I think you could use them sort of to, you know, okay, so yeah, so um, good feedback there in, in the chat. Um, you know, folks have said, Tanya, thank you, um, Sherry, that she would use it as a kickoff or an introduction to the topic. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, Kathy Joe, great. Yeah, definitely will use maybe as a follow-up at the end of the year. Absolutely, because we're, you know, we're, we're wrapping up the year for most of you. Um, we're in the final stretch. I'm sure there's never been a year that you've been happier to be in the final stretch of the year. Um, and so, um, you yeah, know, definitely one of those kinds of uh, things that you can use. And yeah, Kevin definitely helps to teach the notion of planning for the unplanned, right? You know, you never know when you're going to need it. And and I like you know, some of the, the the tips that that were given are absolutely dead on. You know, name it your emergency savings. You know, make sure that you're not getting any fees attached to that, um, especially if it's something that you don't touch very often and um, what have you. You know, know that know how much you need to have in there, but you know, keep it separate. And you know, a lot of those are just really good practical pieces of information that can be used. So um, certainly you could use this, uh, you know, as, as Tanya said, to kick off a, a, a topic, a, a lesson. You could also definitely, um, you know, use it to have students, you know, watch and then say, you know, what other, what other information would you share? Like, what do you wish that they would have said? You can look at it from a critical perspective in that way. Uh, you could use this as a model for, um, you know, a quick introductory, you know, for students to create their own video um, and have a very creative process. So, you know, lots of different things that you could do um, with these. I think, um, you know, the, the fact that it's somebody, um, you know, somebody different. We, we used to talk about, you know, you know, you, you, if somebody else comes in and says the exact same thing that you do as a teacher, you know, all of a sudden they're really smart because it's not you, right? It's kind of like when somebody else tells your kids, you know, to do something and they listen, um, you're like, hey, isn't that what I just told them, right? Um, so uh, again, you know, sort of that instant expert that you can, you can bring into your classroom at a moment's notice. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this next one. This one is called American Paycheck. And this one's a little bit different. And this is really about um, earning income and how people are earning income in various cities across the country. And so in each of these episodes, they have taken um, sort of a road trip and gone to a city. And so um, we're going to take a look at this one where they have stopped in um, Austin, Texas. Uh, to my knowledge, this person is not related to me <laughs> or to my husband, uh, but happens to have the same last name. So uh, let's meet this character and see what he has to say and find out what they're what they're going to learn about um, working in really the tech industry in Austin, Texas.
Millennials are America's future and often its favorite punchline. People say we're young, but the oldest millennials are nearing 40. People say we're dumb, but we're the most educated generation ever. And people say we're spoiled, but we're the first generation in American history who'll be worse off financially than our parents. We're traveling across the country to find out how young Americans are surviving, and in some cases thriving. I'm Brad Hunt, and this is American Paycheck. A massive tech boom has made Austin one of the fastest growing cities in the country, with young people working in jobs and industries that didn't exist a decade ago. I work at HEB. I'm a quality engineer for Whirlpool. And what brought you to Austin? Um, a job that I don't work at anymore. <laughs> We're here at one of the city's most prominent tech startups, the virtual reality video game developer, Alchemy Labs. My name is Devin Reimer. I am the CE Owl at Alchemy Labs. I first got my TI-83 graphing calculator um, in school and I started to learn that I could actually program things on it. Um, so one of the first things I did is started making games um, and then applications. And I actually wrote an application to solve physics problems for my grade 11 physics class. And so I gave my apps to a friend and then he gave it to his friend and his friend and his friend. And then what ended up happening was everybody in the class had the same application um, and then all failed the test in the exact same way. There was one bug inside the application. <laughs> <laughs> Every video game we make can make zero dollars. It's like, that's what we're planning for, right from, right from day one. It's like, hey, we're working on an independent game, we're gonna spend like a year on it, but the books need to balance if we make zero dollars. And so what we used to do is contract work before it, and we'd save out just enough money that we could get through that, and then we finished it, and then roll on to the next one. Because what we saw with everybody else was like, video games are so hit-driven that if you sink everything you have into the one video game, assuming it's gonna be the one that's gonna take off and it doesn't, then your company collapses. And we're like, that's not sustainable, not the way we wanna run things. And so we, we ran into the zero dollar thing uh, and it worked really well because sometimes we would have hits, sometimes we wouldn't. And it allowed us to always just move on to the next thing and get better. Most of our expenses in the early days was just eating ourselves, right? It's like, how do I put a roof over my own head and how do I eat long enough that we can kind of like do this stuff? With um, Job Simulator, part of the thing that was magical in that is the freedom to do what you wanted within that space. And so it's like, at any point, it's like, okay, I want to pick up a cup, I want to fill it up with coffee, and I want to toss it at a bot across the uh, across the cubicle, right? And then all of a sudden, overnight, our game with a few thousand people all of a sudden went to a few million people. I know it sounds crazy that someone would work all day and then come home to play a video game about working. But when you consider that 71% of millennials feel disengaged at their job, it starts to make some sense. This is the new Austin. Ergonomic chairs, computers, and motion sensors everywhere. But this is where our employees work. It's the most open floor plan that's possible with a VR studio. We have our chill pod here, um, which is kind of where we encourage employees, you know, if they need to get up and kind of refresh their brain and go in here. If there's scooters, there's like little like yoga balls that we have and like lacrosse balls. So take a moment away from your desk to kind of chill. So it's the chill pod. In my role at Alchemy, so it's studio director, marketing, knowledge, it's my full title. I went to university initially for journalism at UT and then switched over to PR. Um, but I only made games as a hobby. I was always interested in video games, like I would play them with my brother, um, and then kind of got interested in making them. My senior year, it was it was definitely like a, oh, I kind of have to make this choice. Am I gonna do something that's more stable, that's more like what my degree, what I thought I was gonna do with my degree, um, or kind of take a risk? And so I did decide to take a risk. I, I quit a kind of well-paying internship so that I could have more hours because I was like, I need to dedicate the time into VR because it was like, there's something really captivating about it that it made me want to be a part of it. I mean, it's like, we're kind of in the beginning of the future of VR right now. So how can you not, how, how can you resist that? So I started out doing contract gigs. And so at that time too, it's like a lot of VR companies were bootstrapping. And so you're kind of taking on a lower pay because you're a startup. It was a lot of like juggling, um, choosing smaller apartments, uh, cho like getting roommates. So I, my rent was like, 400 bucks instead of 800 bucks. And that's like a really small like apartment in Austin. You kind of have to do those things to survive. Uh, there are neighborhoods where older houses are being torn down. They're rising the rent there and forcing those people out. And that's happened a lot here. Some people come to Austin for reasons other than following their dreams or pursuing business opportunities. Chris moved across the planet to marry his wife, but being in love doesn't pay the bills. So my name's Chris, um, 35, originally from Sydney, Australia, and I've been in Austin for 
three and a half years or so now. So right now I do uh, Uber and Lyft during the day and then do the scooter stuff at night time. And that way it sort of gives me a bunch of freedom to do what I want. Not every tech job is glamorous. Chris makes his living doing the legwork that's often left out of the hopeful Silicon stories. He collects and charges some of the over 17,000 electric scooters that have flooded the city. When it first came out, it was really good. They paid seven bucks a scooter when they first launched. And so you could do real well, because you know you could. there was not many people doing it, so there wasn't as much competition. See what we can find here. If you guys hear one, feel free to tell me, because we're, we're, we're having it. We're shit out of luck tonight. And then you get to ones like this that just don't exist. They'll try and pick up a scooter and it's just not worth it for me to drive. You know, if you spend 10, 15 minutes to get one, you've missed out on another four. And people just don't usually leave them where they're supposed to. And so once you get to the scooter, it actually tells you on here the, the serial number. Oh, then um, you can just check it. And so you can check it. So you hit the, the harvest button and it gives you a little light. And there's, a, there's a little barcode. You scan it, it tells you how much you're gonna make for it, how much battery life it's got. This one has 37% left, so it's gonna take around about two hours to charge. And then when do you have to drop it back on? They let you drop it off once it's fully charged, anytime before 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, it's not, it's not very good. If you uh, tan it, I don't usually come home without at least 12. I think Australians are known for being more relaxed. I mean, we have a minimum at a full-time job of 20 annual leave days a year or vacation days. When I came here and I, you know, I looked around at getting a couple of full-time jobs and they offer you, most of them, somewhere around the 10 days, you know, it, it, it seems like it's all work and no play. It, it doesn't take an intelligent person to do it, but I think you can be better at in everything you do in life, you can be better than the next person at doing it. And you learn really quick that you need to work out how to budget because when you run out of money, you run out of money real fast. Is Austin's tech gold rush a glimpse into the future for the rest of the South or just a boom and bust? Only time will tell. For now, all that matters is tomorrow's paycheck. So I'm curious what resonated with any of you in that. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot that you could be, that you could use in that. You could also choose to only use certain segments that could certainly be um, sort of chunked out into each one of those, like the, the tech startup piece. Um, it you know, could be its own little, little piece and story. I loved how um, <clears throat> a number of things about that one, you know, a story about somebody who thought they were going to go in and had studied something, you know, specific in university or college. Um, and ended up, you know, going into and doing and following, um, you know, what she what she really, you know, sort of had as a passion, right? And ended up in a field that wasn't where she planned to go. Um, her conversation about working for a startup and, you know, what that's like. I mean, if you go into a startup uh, as a as a, you know, one of the first employees. In particular, you know, there's a lot of upside potential for that down the road, especially if the company does incredibly well, but there's a lot of risk, right? And, you know, she talked about the the impact of, you know, that, that financial impact. Um, so, um, and then, you know, other talk, other conversations about how, you know, the tech scene growing in Austin um, has, you know, caused uh, the cost of housing to go up. Um, and then you see these unconventional jobs, like who, I, I mean, granted, where I live, there aren't um, services where you can just, you know, pick up an a, a electronic or electric scooter and ride it and then just drop it somewhere. Um, I didn't really know that was completely a thing. <laughs> I think I'd heard about it, but not really like seen, you know, the details certainly never thought about that. Somebody goes around and collects those and charges them. And I love that he was so open about, you know, hey, this isn't the most glamorous job. You don't have to be brilliant to do it. But you know, he works really hard at uh, what he does. And he says, you know, you can always, you know, be the best at whatever it is you're doing. And so, um, you know, those are some sort of those, you know, sort of key messages. Um, and I think, you know, having students watch some of these stories and look at, you know, what what is it that you are taking away from these, you know, um, write up a, a quick synopsis um, could very easily be integrated into an activity um, or even be used kind of as a, a meaningful filler at some point between different things um, as something that's kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, somebody uh, mentioned um, using it with entrepreneurship um, shows a lot of the difficulties and, and failures that go along with it. I love the 
the, the CE owl, um, as he calls himself, you know, talking about how they fund their venture and making sure that, you know, unlike other companies that put a ton of money and effort into something, and then if it fails, they're in trouble, you know, basically, you know, saving up and making it sort of a zero dollar um, initiative. So really fascinating. And, and again, all of these different ones um, and from all over the country. So, you know, a little bit closer to home, Baltimore, West Virginia. Um, and then we have ones, you know, Montana, Los Angeles, there's Atlanta, um, North Dakota, Detroit, Portland, Oregon, lots of different ones uh, in this series that, that you can go and explore. Um, this next one is called Tip Jar. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jean Chotsky or not. She is a fantastic um, financial expert. She's been um, featured um, a lot on television and elsewhere. She's written a number of books. Um, and she's, you know, sort of well known for giving financial advice, right? Um, and so uh, the way that these videos work is that individuals have sort of this question or this challenge or this problem that they're trying to deal with. And the beginning of the video is sort of a setup for what that problem or challenge is. And then Jean comes in and provides some really practical advice. And so um, I think there's some different ways that you could use these. Um, this one I'm not going to show, show you. Um, they're on the site and um, for bandwidth issues, it's a lot easier if I can download these. So I usually end up pulling them from YouTube. Um, these are not, or at least I couldn't find them on YouTube. So um, you're gonna have to go and, and uh, your homework assignment is to watch at least one of these um, afterwards. But they all start you know, in that similar way. Um, if I were using these in class, one of the things I might think about um, is actually using them. So like if you were to use the adulting with Richard um, Sherman at the beginning of a lesson or a topic, I might use these towards the end. And the reason being that what you could do is you could show that setup, right? So like, um, you know, here's somebody who is thinking about, um, you know, this one about Roman getting your first credit card, worried about falling into the traps of credit cards. He never signed up for one. Now he's, you know, ready to, to do that. So, you know, okay, so here's the story about Roman. Pause, right? So now that we've had this lesson, what would your advice to Roman be, right? So have engaged students talk about the, you know, what the, the issue at hand is. And then, okay, unpause, play. Let's see what the, the financial expert said. Okay, now, did that align with what we came up with or you came up with as students? You know, what were the similarities and differences? Do you agree with the advice that was given? Do you think that there was something that she should have mentioned that we learned about in class that she didn't? Maybe a missed opportunity. Did she mention something about this topic that we didn't cover in class that, you know, was sort of new to you? So um, I think it's a, a neat way to sort of, um, you, could, you could really kind of bookend some of your your lessons with with these two um, with that adulting piece and then tip jar so um, again lots of different topics that are folk um, that are covered in this series and I uh, I'd love for you to go and check some of those out so um, this next one is called face plant and so to the point earlier about you know difficulties of entrepreneurs this is a some of these are entrepreneurs, but a lot of them are just individuals who are doing an incredible job right now. But at some point along the the, the line, they failed miserably, right? Um, and I, I love some of the phrases that we hear nowadays, like fail is, you know, first attempt in learning, right? F-A-I-L. And so um, these are, you know, the, the series called Faceplant is all about that. They are people who have fallen down, but pick themselves back up. So uh, let's watch a quick uh, um, intro or trailer for this so you can kind of get an idea of the, the, the flavor of these. Hello, this is Blowzell. I'm Nancy Liu. My name is Peter Ramsey. My name is India Kenny Stearns. I was fortunate to be named Forbes 30 Under 30. I'm one of the directors of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I am a television media professional. I'm a veteran motion picture stuntman. A three-time Olympic medalist. And this is my face plan. I always say, I never got tough by winning fights. I got tough by losing fights. Talk about face plant? I had no job. People were leaving out of my life. This doesn't mean anything. You're gonna be fine. But like very deep inside, I was freaking out. The stock market crashed in 2008, and that's when everything started to crumble. They said, hey, Nancy, we, we need to talk to you. Uh, we don't want you as CEO anymore. Whoa. I was already crying a lot. 
Oh, his chin. Yeah. Not because of the pain, just because how embarrassed I was. You read these headlines on the internet like, epic flop. Man, is this going to hurt me or what? You didn't want to hear your own thoughts. It's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, nobody's watching you. Nobody cares. Like, you got to stop that recording. There's one thing. Is the camera still rolling? The Marine Corps always taught me, be prepared. A month later, my co-founders came back to me and said, Nancy, we made a really big mistake. We need you as CEO. You get to decide whether you just go through it or you grow through it. And then we got nominated for the Oscar. You know, you're looking out of the audience and there's like Spike Lee, Barry Jenkins. My God, what happened? What is this? Hey, Gozell. Hello. How are you? I have a hug. Good to see you. I hugged him. They say, don't touch him. I touched him. He smelled like sandalwood and power. <laughs> I started my own business. And so here we are today. It just shows you how the littlest, smallest thing can change the entire course of your life. So I love those. I think, you know, they're they're really good. Um, and uh, you can choose, you know, any of these to show. Um, I think I might think about um, talking about that notion of perseverance, especially in, you know, we all face setbacks at some point in our lives. They might be um, something that influences our finances, like with a job, the loss of a job, the failure of a um of, uh, of a business like this, this one that's listed here first, um, you know, all sorts of different things that, that help us to, um, you know, become who we are. Um, I think in a classroom setting, I think it'd be fascinating to share um, or to divide students up into small groups um, or have students pick one and, um, and watch it and then, you know, maybe debrief um, and sort of do some comparison and con or comparing and contrasting about some of the sort of common themes. So I loved the one, um, well, there are two quotes out of that uh, trailer that I liked. One was the, the stuntman here, um, Conrad uh, Palmasano, who says, um, I got tough by losing fights, right? Like he didn't, you don't get tough by winning, you get tough by losing. Um, and I thought that was a really fascinating, um, that that wasn't a, an example that I had really heard before and, and it resonated with me. The other one um, is that you either, um, uh, I wrote it down, you, you go through it or you grow through it, right? So like, are you going through this hard time or are you growing through this hard time, right? It's, it's that whole notion of mindset and how we think about um, the challenges that we face and what we do with that um, really makes a big, big difference. Um, so I know a couple of the folks that are on with us this evening are family and consumer science teachers. And not that this is just for FCS teachers, um, but um, the uh, series Milk Money is fantastic. Um, it's a it's all about um, families with kids and raising children in today's economy and sort of these the intermix of um, relationships and children and finances and all of these different life choices that we make and how all of these really can be so like interconnected and intertwined. So if you're teaching um, personal finance as part of say a general FCS course or you know, you're, you're integrating topics or trying to find um, connections you know, with family, um, uh, the families and, and um, child development with relationships um all of those would be really good and and i love some of the diversity that's shown um in this series as well so um again like some of the other ones i'm going to share with you this trailer um and then we're going to pick one of them and it's a little long so i'm not going to show you the entire thing but um i'll give you give you sort of a taste of of one of these um so here we go how much I talk to my son about money. Not as much as I should. Money for me is a taboo. It reflects how I'm doing as an adult, as a professional. Having kids definitely changed my relationship with money for sure. Like, I just have a bigger fear of something crashing down. You know, people breaking their backs and getting these bachelors and masters and stuff like that only to get paid chump change. Nobody teaches you about money in school. Nannies are like 25 bucks an hour. I'm like, that's how much I make. I remember crying like, I don't know how we're going to pay rent next month. We 
we were in credit card debt over $20,000. There is no way that I won't go back to my job. I love it so much, I live for it. I work at a clothing store. I do deliveries. I don't really get much sleep. I'm probably getting about three to four good hours of sleep, if that. With twins, not only is it like twice the work, but it's also twice the equipment, twice the formula, twice the playthings. My mom lived in this two bedroom, one bathroom house with us. Having my mom here saved us thousands of dollars in childcare. We may not, you know, own a house, but we don't care about that. The beach is our backyard. I think one of the biggest surprises is just how much trust we have in each other. The secret to a marriage is not always about love. You have to really like the person that you're with. I'm just so happy to see my mom so happy. I would be dead or in jail if it wasn't for him. It's so important to just appreciate what your kids do for your life. It's amazing like, to feel our house become a home. All that you feel like is wrong, it's like you can write it through your kids. Thing is, though, there's no instruction manual for parents. So out of curiosity, did any of those themes resonate with any of you, um, either from a, from a, through teacher lens or um, perhaps through your parent lens? Um, you know, this, we, we heard a lot in that about, you know, money being a taboo topic, about, you know, some of the challenges to get by and to, you know, the importance of doing things with, um, for the benefit of your family. Uh, the... Um, I, I love the one about, you know, and the Annie makes how much that's, you know, as much as I make. So like, is it worth it to go to work and pay for childcare? You know, all of these kinds of things that um, you know, are, are absolutely real life issues, right? So um, you hear some, uh, or you see here are some of the, uh, the titles and, and the topics uh, that are in the series. Um, and they, you know, they really range. And so you can um, check out some of those um, different topics. And I would definitely encourage you to watch each one of them and see, you know, um, is it going to be appropriate? You know, what can you pull out of it for your students? So, um, and again, like some of the others, you could also, you know, think about just showing, you know, a snippet um, or a portion of some of these. So um, I'm going to share with you one that I thought um, really brought out a lot of different um, so really just sort of, to, again, to that sort of notion of like how, all, how interconnected and interwoven all, a lot of these issues are. And so um, this one, this one I thought was great. She's a, um, a single mother who went through the, uh, went to the military, um, got her education. You'll, you'll hear her story. And I just love the sort of this documentary storytelling um, uh, version or, you know, or, approach, I guess is the word I'm looking for, um, with these videos. I just, you know, they're really incredibly well done as, are, as is everything in the series, but let's check this one out. I created a budgeting system for myself where it's time-based. So my budget is laid out to show how many hours I have to work for an item versus how much money it's going to cost. So. Like, for example, my rent costs me 20 hours a month. Do I really want this $10 bottle of wine that's gonna be two hours of my time or an hour of my time? A lot of solo parents have this mindset of, I can't do it by myself. I have to keep a, a fairly strict routine in order to get everything done. And so Mondays is the day that I get all of the meal planning and list making and grocery shopping done. And sometimes in a day, I'll go to three or four stores just to get the best deal. I hate that. Well, you can suck it up. Well, how, how would you describe us together? Are we pretty cool? Fun. Fun. My mom is weird. Um, she is funny. She means my life. Um, she means, um, she means a lot of things. Jaden is one of those dream kids that, you know, every parent wishes that they had. I mean, he's sweet, he's patient, he's compassionate. It's like he's a 60-year-old wise sage trapped in an almost 8-year-old's body. <laughs>
finding out I was pregnant was a huge surprise. Um, I was on birth control, used protection, and used the morning after pill, and um, he's meant to be <laughs> here. <laughs> I think any parent hopes that their child would do better than the, than they are financially. And I mean, he's already miles ahead of what I was like, socially and emotionally. I was probably about 15 when I was just feeling really lost in the direction I wanted to take my life. I really wanted to get out of the town I was living in, where the three career choices were either get married right after high school, start popping off kids, become an alcoholic, or make meth. I just was done and wanted to get out, so I got my GED and joined the military. I just had this uncontrollable urge to just get out, and the Army was the easiest way. So I went to the mall where they have all the different branches lined up in their offices and just kind of stood in front, and whatever way I just started walking, I just went there, and I signed up for five years active duty. It was intense at first because I had no clue what to expect. And I was this little homeschool girl going to where people are screaming at me. Serving in the Middle East was, was very eye-opening. There's OIF, which is Operation Iraqi Freedom, and then there's OEF, which is Operation Enduring Freedom, which is the Afghan mission. So um, I was getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan and all soldiers have to go through um, it's a soldier readiness program, and all the women have to get blood pregnancy tests. And I have see this clipboard and the medics like crossing names off the list, and I see a blue line across mine. Like, oh, what does that mean? She's like, oh, congratulations, you're pregnant. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? What? <laughs> so then I just I bawled on some dude that I didn't even know, shoulder like uniform, snotted all over it for like 30 minutes. And then I went to uh, call the person that I was seeing at the time, and the first words out of his mouth were, oh, when are you gonna get that taken care of? <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew I was gonna be okay when he curled his little hand around me. I was like, you got this. I was trying to breastfeed my son, and after six weeks, I wasn't able to feed my kid anymore because he was literally at daycare from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I have a lot of military mom guilt because I didn't have that choice to be able to stay home with him. I got out of the military January 1st, 2013, and then it's like, okay, now what? So I just on a whim enrolled in college and got my associate's degree. I'm like, let's keep going, what's next? So I found a program through the city when we first moved here called CCAP, it's the Child Care Assistance Program. It's a subsidized child care program and if it wasn't for CCAP, I wouldn't have been able to attend college because child care is so expensive. And here I sit now, five years later, with an associate's, a bachelor's degree and completely debt free. If it wasn't for the GI Bill, there's no way that I could have ever afforded to go to college and live in one of the most expensive cities in the U.S. I realized that education is something that I needed to move on and move up to be where I want to be. And he said that, what did you say you want to be when you grow up? That's easy, engineer. Yes, which kind of takes a little bit of college. In terms of his education, mm. it's a bit intimidating. And I see some of the price tags on these private schools, and I just talked to the, uh, the admissions counselor, Susan, and I told her straight up, I was like, you know, I'm a single parent. I don't have hardly any funds. I live off of $2,000 a month. And she was like, you know, we'll go through the scholarship process and we'll see what happens. So when we were awarded the scholarship, I just started bawling. <laughs> it was very, it was very emotional and overwhelming because it is the best school in Boulder. And he's thrived. We pay $500 a year and they allow me to make payments. I want to save the earth because um, I'm going to build submarines that, um, that pick up trash from the bottom of the ocean. Single parents, from my experience, I think we're kind of seeing a little bit as the, the dregs of society. 
you usually think of a woman of color who has one or more children, may or may not be living off of the system, and, you know, people have certain opinions. And I've experienced both sides. I've had people commend me because they don't know how to do it on their own. And on the other hand, I've people have come up to me like, you know, why don't you just find a partner to help take care of your kid? And it's it can get frustrating. I, I've missed out on like school functions and Valentine's Day parties and feeling like somebody else is raising my kid while I'm doing what I need to do to better our circumstance. Then that's when I decided to just start working for myself after school because I'm, I'm tired of missing out on his life. I'm So in the interest of time, I'm going to leave you hanging <laughs> to finish um, her story and find out where things go. But, um, you know, there's a lot in this that I loved. First of all, I would probably use the beginning of it um, without even showing the rest just to talk about that time-based budget, um, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and, you know, this notion of in order to um, pay for this, I need to work for this amount of time or, you know, I... I work for this amount of time, you know, is it worth that, um, that expense, you know, in that trade off in time, especially when you find out later on that she's, you know, that she is working for herself, she knows exactly how much, um, you know, work she has to do at this point, um, you know, on an hourly basis kind of thing. Um, so uh, a lot of different pieces and parts in there, I think you could really unpack some of this in terms of um, some of the support that she received, the GI Bill, the, the child care program, the expense of child care, which if you're doing things with um, child development or running a child care in your, um, in your school, uh, mentioned the, the connections there with FCS, you know, just lots of things I think that you can do with this. And, and there's, you know, again, these are, these are real people's stories, you know, so um, kind of an intimate uh, pulling back of the curtain to, to see what's going on in their lives and, and again, those inner connections. So uh, this next one, we've just got a couple of uh, last ones that I wanna just talk about here at the end, making lemonade. Um, quite a few of these are entrepreneurial stories um, or about career changes. And so this, um, uh, the most recent one is about somebody who went from being a financial advisor to actually being a pro um, um, pro esports gamer. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of students that are interested in that. And again, so these are all like super relevant, super recent. Um, a lot of these shot in 2020, 2021 even. So um, I encourage you to, to check those out. Hi. Um, Working Nation is one of their partners at Million Stories, and so this is considered partner content as opposed to um, an original series, but they have a whole bunch of different um, short, like a minute and a half, so I'm going to show one of these here, um, videos on specific jobs, and a lot of these are jobs that are growing in demand, um, and so you see um, a, data, uh, a data scientist, there's a wind turbine technician, um, these, are, these are ones that are expected to grow. Um, in demand. And so making that connection between, you know, finding something that you love doing, um, but also something that will have demand for that job in the future, um, which is so important. So let's check this one out. And I'm going to just get here a little bit further into it. Um, so this one is a forensic, uh, forensic uh, scientist, I believe is what it's called. One. Do you ever watch crime shows on television and wonder what really goes on behind the scenes in a crime lab? Well, check out Joe Perrion. He's a Nibin technician at the Houston Forensic Science Center. A Nibin technician is a person who primarily works with the incoming guns from the city of Houston. Nibin stands for the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, and it's maintained by the ATF and a company called FTI. Nibin Tech is essentially one part of the entire firearm section, and the firearm section is one of the many disciplines that works within a forensic science lab. My main goal in forensic science was to become a firearms examiner. So this is kind of like a way to get my foot in the door and start working with guns. We'll take all the crime evidence that are specifically firearms that come in. We will know everything about the gun, like make, model, caliber. If it's broken, if it's missing a part, if it needs to be fixed, we'll try to fix it. We'll note all that information. We'll then uh, take the gun and we'll shoot three cartridges out of it. And from there, we'll then take those cartridges and enter them into the knife. 
So you see a little bit of a flavor for this. I think this is totally relevant. This one in particular, um, the news the last couple of days around down here is that there's, um, they got a bunch of guns, um, uh, captured or seized a bunch of guns in, in New York. And they were talking about how they were able to match the, the guns to a bunch of um, uh, casings and such that had been left at a bunch of different crimes. And I was like, wow, hey, this connects. It's like really cool. Um, so anyhow, there's somebody I was like, I didn't know about the system. And so anyhow, um, you can learn things all the time, um, not just your kids, but, but you as well um, and watching some of these videos. So um, so speaking of uh, these videos, let me just uh, show you. These are This is a list of the different um, uh, uh, careers or jobs that are covered in uh, this series. So you can um, definitely check those out. And then as I often do when I'm doing these things, I ended up kind of squirreling. So I was on their YouTube channel to grab these. Um, these are also all, uh, over on Million Stories. Um, and I did what we call in our house squirreling. So like if you ever watch the movie Up, the dog's like squirrel and takes off. Um, so I squirreled to something that I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, so I was watching other videos from them and I found this one, which was this analogy that I'd never heard. And now that I've, um, I can't unhear it. And I just thought I would share it with all of you because um, it's, it's, a, it's a great one for, for spending money. So here we go. It was a time where I had three jobs. I was working at Taco Bell, I was a delivery guy for Pizza Hut, and I was doing security uh, at nightclubs and various parties. I was working three jobs to make sure I had money to pay for rent, pay for bills, keep myself fit. I'm not the type of person to say I'm broke and I don't have any money. So I stress financial literacy. My favorite that I just tell to all my friends and everyone is the toilet paper. When You've got a full roll of toilet paper sitting there, so you use it like relentlessly. Versus when you see the cardboard showing, you tend to use it less. You're more knowledgeable of, okay, I have to wipe my behind with less paper, so I'm gonna wipe, I'm gonna fold. Use less toilet paper, right? So it's the same with your money. Just because you've got $10,000 in your pocket, the moment that you see your pocket getting flat, that's when you wanna slow down. You have to be financially literate. You want to make sure you're making smart decisions with your money, smart investments, putting money to the side. Okay, so now that you've heard that analogy, uh, spending money is like um, you know that last roll of toilet paper. You can't like unsee it, right? Like, so I'm totally going to use that um, going forward, <laughs> and I encourage all of you to as well. So that's definitely um, a topic I would do. Um, and then one of the other things that caught my attention, and a little squirrel, was over on the Million Stories website, um, going through their blog I, and some other things. I found this video. This is actually a music video from Marshmallow um, that. It doesn't have any lyrics, but it has, um, you, you could like watch the entire thing and have your students like write the story of like what happened. Um, so it's basically this whole notion of like seeing this ad, wanting to become a DJ, um, needing a mix board, say going to work, saving all that money and um, being able to do it and, and get into that that um, that business. And, and so it's really cool. It's the official video. It's on Marshmallow's um, YouTube channel as well. It's, um, it's pretty neat. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Um, uh, but I'll just I'll just briefly go through here. It's like a little screen capture from it. Um, so anyhow. I apologize if that came in really loud. It came in really loud on my headset as well, too. Um, so anyhow, there's a couple of other series in here. George Goes Everywhere is a guy who goes around to different cities across the country and has fun only uh, without spending more than $100. So it goes all over, the, all over different places. Um, lots of cool things I there. Heads or Tails is really a um, series that's on Instagram. So this is another one that, that you can check out. Glozell, we met um, in one of those previews earlier. Um, she was one of the original um, uh, folks to gain a great audience um, on YouTube. And then when they changed their monetization and how they served up videos, um, she went broke. And so she tells her story about um, the challenges that she's had and um, trying to sort of break the taboos of talking about money. Um, so really, really neat um, uh, person there as well. So um, lots of different videos that you can check out. I hope that you'll take some time to follow up on some of these. 
It's, um, you know, think about how you could use them with your own students, whether it's to introduce a topic to sort of creatively wrap up a, um, a lesson like the idea of like the tip jar ones with, um, you know, once it, once you've had something, you know, look at the question somebody had, look at the advice, you know, what advice would you give them and then look at the advice from the professional. Um, some of these sort of stories of, um, you know, integrated within some of the other things that you're talking about, maybe with relationships or child development or parenting, um, you know, just or, you know, entrepreneurship and, and, you know, the importance of learning from failure and growing through things, not just going through them. So um, lots that can be done. I hope that this um, is a resource that you'll end up using. If you do, let me know. would love to hear and have you follow up. So um, thanks again for joining us. I know that you have lots of opportunities and other things that you could be doing with your time, but I'm glad that you chose to spend it here with us. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.